Welcome to the Movement PT Coffee Cast, where we sit down and talk about physical therapy, health, and whatever else comes to mind during our coffee-infused conversations. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Movement PT Coffee Cast. My name's Dalton, and with me, as always, is my beautifully bearded friend, William. William, how are we doing today? Great, man. Uh, welcome to uh, the Cycle Club. I'm extremely pumped. What do you think? It was amazing. Great process. No, let me, let me just, yeah, let me be real. Let me be real. The process of making the coffee, amazing, 100%. Like, you like the Bunsen burner, you feel like it's like, you feel like Harry Potter, you know, you're making, <laughs> making potions, and then... The coffee itself, really good. Mm. I would agree with you in the sense it's a little bit of a blend between the AeroPress and the Chemex. Yeah. Smooth, pretty strong. I would give it a say. Yeah, I would give it a solid like eight out of ten. That sounds, I think, pretty accurate. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Process is better than the product. Oh, look at that. Yeah, process greater than the product. said that. That's before. deep, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, guys, enough about the coffee. Let's get into our guest today. Uh, so we're back at it again with another interview. This week we're interviewing a strength and conditioning coach out of Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. Represent um, Ian Schnarr. He is the head strength and conditioning coach at Redline Conditioning. Ian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, boys. Excited to be here. No problem, man. How about you? All right, let's just get right into the coffee right off the bat because you're drinking coffee. We haven't had guests that drink coffee in a while. So, Ian, like, let us know how you're brewing your coffee and what you're drinking. That's uh, the borderline unacceptable to not have coffee on this I, podcast. But I uh, I'm, believe it or not, I'm just a standard. I'm a standard kind of Americano guy. So we uh, got an espresso a while back. We've been using that at home, obviously. Just get the espresso and then just the hot water in there. And then and when we go out, we got a couple cool coffee spots actually in town here. Um, just with kind of Kitchener being obviously such a massive tech hub. There's there's a bunch of cool kind of hipster cafe style places and um again i don't know i'm always kind of just an americano guy keep it simple um my wife could tell you all about all the fancy ristretto shots and all the different stuff she opts for sometimes but uh i'm just a basic black black americano guy hey i, I appreciate that yeah maybe your wife has to come on and like school us about that <laughs> yeah <laughs> She knows her stuff, man. She'll but order some like, stuff, and I have no idea what it is. <laughs> but you're, you're a good old Canadian kid. you got to drink some Tim Hortons, right? Yeah. Actually, believe it or not, I I do drink Tim Hortons, but believe it or not, I, I try to opt for it at McDonald's. McDonald's actually has a real good real good coffee if you're just going for just a standard coffee. Yeah, I'm with you on that. <clears throat> cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, let's get, into, let's get into you. Let's start talking a little bit about, you know <laughs> – who you are, what you're doing with Redline Conditioning. Give our listeners a little bit of insight into who you are. Yeah, so basically, um, as you guys kind of alluded to there, I'm strength and conditioning coach in Kitchener, Ontario, here at a place called Redline Conditioning. Um, our kind of primary focus, I guess, is, is just like any other strength and conditioning. So we, we kind of have 90% athletes as kind of the bread and butter of our business. Um, we're lucky enough to be the official strength and conditioning but provider for uh the kitchen rangers in the ohl so we've been with them for uh 10 years now um been lucky enough to work with and continue to work with obviously some of some of the best athletes in the world i mean when you go down our kind of alumni and current athlete list uh we got a lot of a lot of people who are at the top of their game right now who are still with us in their respective sports not just hockey um so that's kind of a big part of our business obviously um and then as well I've been there about seven years now. So seven years ago, I started what I kind of termed an adult performance program. I didn't want to get into any of that kind of boot camp style stuff. That was never really what I was into. So I developed an, a program for our adult population, uh, which began with uh, six original members. And now we got about 150 who are all kind of monthly members um, working on building their strength, their athleticism, um, developing some resiliency things like that so yeah we do things a little bit different in terms of that market athlete yourself Ian like how'd you get yeah. into uh, strength and conditioning yeah but I was uh, I played a bunch of sports growing up and uh, basketball was always kind of my go-to so 
played basketball from age, I don't know, probably six or seven, right up till early 20s. Uh, but then I was also a big golfer, obviously, in the summertime. Uh, I love golf, getting out with the boys. Uh, a couple of the buddies have memberships, so we're big golfers. Uh, played tennis growing up, lacrosse growing up, uh, baseball, football. I played pretty much every sport except for hockey, believe it or not. Um, conveniently, I'm in that field now, but uh, I was never a hockey guy. Um, that was always my brother's sport, but this happened to kind of fall in place, and, and we're here now. Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like if you're in Canada and you're a strength and conditioning coach, you probably have to, uh, probably going to have to deal with some hockey players, eh? 100%, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're blessed. I mean, Kitchener's got, we got some good athletes in Kitchener um, from a variety of sports. I mean, when you look at, like, you can look at guys like Mark Shifley, who's arguably at the top of the NHL game. He's right up there. Uh, you got guy, girls, sorry, like uh, Sarah Pavin, who's number one ranked volleyball player in the world. Um, Tanner Pearson, NHL pro, obviously, all these local talent, Mike Hoffman, guys like that from local. Um, so Kitchener is a good breeding ground for a lot of a lot of good athletes from a variety of sports. So yeah, it's been good. I'm really curious about that because I've never worked with somebody that's really well known like that. So I'm curious what it was like the first time you had somebody who had a name attached to them. You know, uh, was it intimidating at first? And How's that kind of progressed? No, in all honesty, and I, I, I kind of tell people this. I mean, I get it where people get almost starstruck like that. Um, but for whatever reason, I've just kind of never – I don't know. I remember younger, obviously a big basketball fan, when I used to go to the Toronto Raptors game, I'd get, I'd get starstruck with that. But for whatever reason, as soon as I started this job, it's almost – you kind of separate the professionalism a little bit. Um, so obviously you've got to be obviously confident with what you're doing when you're working with kind of high-level athletes like that. Uh, but no, I never really got too starstruck with, them. I mean, at the end of the day, they're coming to you, right? They're coming to you for your expertise, um, for your knowledge. They're not, they're not there. Our, our gym, if you see our gym set up, it's, um, it's not, it's not a fancy gym. We don't have anything. We're kind of buried off of a side street. Um, so we don't have any flashy stuff, any spotlights right off the highway. And that's honestly what a lot of our pro guys love. They love the fact that it's not a proper Oxy style gym. They come in, they just get to kind of grind it out off of a side street where lights are turned down low and no one kind of knows you're in the building doing what you're doing. Um, so yeah, for whatever reason, I don't know. I've always just kind of separated that professionalism from kind of starstruck attitude. Um, and it seemed to work. Yeah. So. Uh, one thing I want to ask you, like, obviously, so we've been, we met you through Instagram and we've been following your Instagram for a while. And um, one thing I've noticed is that you, you tend to take like a very holistic approach in terms of taking into consideration a lot of factors of the people that you're, you're working with almost sort of along the lines of like a biopsychosocial approach. Is that something you've always been like big on or have you just started to kind of like dive into that? And why is that important to your, uh, to your training? Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's something I've taken a huge kind of liking to um, recently. It is something I pride myself in um, for kind of bridge that gap between obviously the BPS model and, and kind of strength and conditioning. Um, my whole kind of method behind it is, um, I, I interact with not only my athletes, but my, my adult clientele on a day-to-day basis. Act on these guys as for your one or two sessions a week in the physio clinic. Um, so that's kind of how it started. I haven't always been that guy, I will admit. Um, when I kind of first got into this, as I said, it's been about seven years now. Um, obviously I didn't know much about it. I uh, didn't really get into the whole kind of BPS pain science thing till probably about three years ago. And that was, that was from our good buddy, obviously Nick Hanna, him and I were having a conversation. Oh my um, God. So I dropped the, dropped the hand of moves tag right there. Come on, gonna... we're trying to get away. <laughs> no. We're not going to stay on him too long. He's got a big enough head as is. So we'll, we'll move right on from that. But, but no, as I said, Nick and I go way back. We uh, high school buddies, former, former teammates with basketball as well. Um, but no, it's actually something I struck up in conversation with him a couple of years ago when he was getting into it. Um, and he kind of opened my eyes to, to seeking out kind of information from guys like, uh, like Greg Lehman and, and Norman Mosley and, um, Peter O'Sullivan and, and kind of these big juggernaut guys in the industry and in, in that realm. Um, and that's kind of what transpired to how I kind of utilize my philosophy to yeah, that, that's awesome that, like, 
you do- dove into that. Um, has like how was that like going from what you traditionally saw? I'm sure like when you first entered in the field, maybe you were a little more I don't know. I guess I you put words in, but maybe more biomechanically heavy or like focused on like analyzing movements and like and then going from that 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 style to maybe adopting more of like the, the biopsychosocial approach and that kind of thing. Now, how has that been like transitioning for you? Hundred percent. I mean, when you when you think about coming out of university with a kin degree um it's just it's just the way the curriculum is i mean we get taught everything we get taught all of all of janda stuff with the lower and the upper cross syndrome and all that stuff um stuff you guys are obviously familiar with as well but kind of coming out of university obviously i did kind of have that that mindset where i i kind of was in this oh this this athlete's got interior pelvic tilt let's see um, like, let's see what we can do. Can we kind of loosen up his hip flexors? Can we tighten his glutes? Can we get his anterior core more active, get him out of that anterior pelvic tilt? Um, so, but yeah, absolutely. I was totally one of those guys. I'm um, not ashamed to admit it. Cause obviously we all grow and, and I'm glad I have kind of moved past that now. Um, but in terms of training itself, I mean, as you guys know, with the whole kind of BPS thing, it comes down to not necessarily right or wrong, but more so kind of how we explain things, you know what I mean? So, um it comes down to just kind of choose <clears throat> excuse me choosing your words a little bit differently um instead of saying they have kind of this anterior pelvic tilt thing where we need to loosen up x and strength and y something like that and we can kind of flip it and say okay it doesn't look like you're getting enough movement out of this area maybe we can incorporate a couple of things just to kind of expose you to movement not necessarily to fix anything um but just to kind of get you exposed to a bit more variability through that area right so it's all just coming down to your word choice and how you explain things to the client in front of you yeah i think that's a big thing is just shifting like the uh the kind of like way you describe trying another option or something like hey uh you know why don't we try it this way like what happens if we kind of try it this way and then you're also like what like for me like one thing that changed is i look at the response to the exercise uh, more so than being so dead set on it needing to be needing to fit this biomechanical explanation, you know, like where you're like, okay, well, it makes sense to me that X, Y, or Z exercise would be beneficial for this person, but how are they kind of responding to that exercise? Like that's been huge for me because right. they don't always fit the kind of expectation that you have, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. I mean, it's funny because obviously as we know it's a, it's a steep uphill battle with kind of adopting this mentality and and kind of leading into this new research that unfortunately people just kind of want to turn a blind eye to even though it is right there and in, in clear-cut science for us um but it's funny i mean you get the old school guys obviously you get the parents coming in and the first thing they do on the initial assessment is say oh check out my kid's posture like what can you do to help with the shoulders or you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Meanwhile, the kid's perfectly fine. He's never had a shoulder issue in his life. He's got no pain with anything whatsoever up top. Um, so it's just changing the whole dynamic. Obviously, it's going to take some time, but I think it is moving in a, in a good direction. And and hopefully, I can continue to do my part. And there's obviously tons of other strength coaches who have adapted it as well. So hopefully, we can continue to do our part. So it's not just you physios and clinicians out there pushing this message forward. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, one, it's awesome that, you, that you're doing that because I think a big, we kind of made a post about this the other day where like all of, like it needs to be like a, a team effort in pushing this this shift forward. And it's, it's got to not just be like physios or chiros or whatever. It's got to be all of us coming together and having some common narratives so that we can all start shifting the public's mind on things. Um, how do you go about like navigating like that when like a, when a patient comes in or a client comes in um, or parent and they're like, they're using that language or those narratives. Like, how do you address that? Um, yeah, I mean that, that gets a little bit tricky. Obviously you try and do your part, your best to kind of explain it to, to kind of the person in front of you. A lot of the times that comes down to, um, building proper rapport. I mean, that's, that's kind of a huge thing I, I take with it as well. Um, from what I've experienced, there's, as you guys know as well, there's, there's some people who can take criticism a little bit better. Um, other people who can't quite handle it as well, or, or they're kind of stuck in their ways almost. Um, so that's a huge factor in terms of choosing the words you want to use with someone. Sometimes you can be a bit straightforward with someone and say, and you can straight up tell them like, look, uh, 
that whole hip flexor pulling your hips down thing is, is essentially garbage. Um, or you could, you kind of got to beat around the bush with it and say, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Um, come back with the findings when you're talking to that parent, it's, it's kind of an opportunity to educate them as well and, and let them know where, as opposed to seeing your, your child or your athlete has an issue like X versus Y or something like that. You can say, I'm going to give him a couple exercises to do at home or a couple of variations we'll throw into his program um, that'll kind of develop and, and give him that resiliency he needs um, instead of essentially highlighting or like re, re-encouraging what the, what the parents said. Um, so that's kind of how I go about it. It seemed like you talked about this before and you kind of mentioned it to us as well, uh, the idea that lots of parents come in asking you to work on like speed work. Is that something you see often? Uh, Cause I, I like, we don't see that as much uh, as physios, but is that something as a strength coach that you run into? Yeah, of course. I mean, you get, you get the parents obviously who think their kid needs whatever to be the next Sidney Crosby. Um, but even, even just this past week, I mean, it's still, like we said, it's, it's going to take a while to change the landscape and it's something even just the past week, checking my emails after the new year here. Um, I've already had two athletes reach out to me from teams saying, um, look, my dad and I put together this speed program. I'm trying to get faster. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working. Is there kind of a program you can put together for me? Um, so again, I haven't seen it, so I don't know the context of it. I, I did reply to those emails, letting them know that there's a lot more that goes into speed work than just kind of the, the hurdles and the lack thinks is needed for for that um, but again that's when it all comes down to the assessment and bringing them in and and letting them know kind of the issues or or the concerns you're seeing not not necessarily issues but the areas you'd like to work on with that athlete because every athlete's completely different sometimes if an athlete needs to become quicker and faster they're going to be doing the complete opposite of speed and explosive stuff they're going to be working on kind of generating some force and some force output with some raw strength stuff, depending on what end of the spectrum they're on um, or vice versa. Right. So that's where the assessment comes into play as with anything. So one of the uh, other things we were want to ask you, I know, like, I'm just curious to see, like I've, I've worked with like some strength coaches and, you know, this big idea of like analyzing movement patterns and stuff when you're kind of going through an assessment and you're, you're having someone squat. Um, what are like, what are some things that like you're looking for, um, when you're like analyzing these movements? So obviously we're looking for, um, I don't do any, when I'm doing like an initial assessment, um, this is something again, just with kind of the recent take over the past couple of years of, of beginning that whole conversation with Nick and kind of got rid of the whole kind of postural assessment aspect of, of when I assess a kid. Um, that's no longer something I, I look at too. I mean, if I see, kind of something where it's if he's going through movement and I see something I'll, I'll make note of it and say okay let's get this kid moving a little bit more through through this area give him a couple more variability options things like that um, but when I was first coming out like we we talked about at the beginning I was that standard kinesiopathological kid who was looking at a kid and, and seeing one shoulder sloped a little bit lower than the other or um, you know one foot pronated the other foot supinated things like that I was and as we we've kind of come to learn that's just it's just not an accurate way to to analyze anyone anymore. So I've completely eliminated that. When it comes to the movement side of things, um, again, I'll take note for the standard stuff. So biomechanics absolutely matter. I mean, no one in the DPS field is saying biomechanics don't matter at all. Um, so when it comes down to movement and we're talking – load and things like that when it comes to teaching a squat i'm absolutely keeping an upright torso and things like that trying to stabilize through the midsection instead of slipping back into um like that low back arch things like that so those are all kind of standard things that i've still kind of carried on with um teaching a good hinge pattern keep keeping a good neutral posture obviously for a hinge pattern um with kind of the end goal of saying, look, when it comes to deadlifting with with a heavier weight or when we're going for like a posterior chain day, this is how I want you to be deadlifting with that weight in your hands. It's not to say if you're picking up your shoes off the floor, you got to do a, a perfect single leg hinge. You know what I mean? 
Uh, right. So again, that comes into just kind of communicating with that athlete or the individual in front of you and, and sharing that up front with. I think there's so many uh, reasons why that's valuable too. Like learning, we, we talk about this pretty often, like learning how to hinge versus how to squat uh, and how to stabilize your midsection and how to transfer force, like all those different options of ways to move and, and to exert force and, and stuff like that are, are valuable in uh, so many ways. It's just a bit different maybe than, than how we uh, viewed it before, but we're still kind of looking for the same things. Hit the nail right on the head, so. Um. <laughs> Another thing I want to talk to you a little bit about was uh, communication. So, like, that's a big thing that's come up in the physio world, like, as of late, the importance of communicating. And, and one of the people that actually I started learning a lot about that from was was a strength coach, like, reading Conscious Coaching by uh, Brett Bartholomew. I was just curious to know, what, like, how, what do you think about, like, communication, why it's important, and maybe some strategies you go about, like, communicating with, with your athletes? Yeah, 100%. I mean, that's always been – First of all, Brett Brett's an absolute giant. I mean, the guy's the guy's a legend in my eyes in terms of guys I look up to in this field. He's he's right up there, if not at the top, just for kind of what he's brought to the strength field. Not only in terms of bringing something different and and getting away from kind of the repetitive stuff that we seem to keep seeing, um, but just for kind of taking on this whole aspect of yeah. communicating with an athlete. Um, it's obviously a mass component. You can have the greatest program in the world that's guaranteed evidence back that it'll, it'll make you jump higher or stronger or whatever you want to call it. But if you can't communicate that with the athlete or, or build that rapport with the athlete, get them motivated to come in to see you, um, the program you've written down on paper is really, it's not going to do anything for them at all. So um, absolutely. Communicating is arguably the most important part of the job, just being able to get that message across to the athlete not only to explain to them kind of what you're doing with them and, and why they're doing it, but it's a good opportunity to, to educate as well. Just like we would do with our clients talking about the BPS model or things like that. It's a good opportunity to educate your client on, on kind of your philosophy um, of, of why you do the training X versus Y and allowing them to, understand the hows and the whys of what we're doing with them because then that's going to go a long way in terms of not only building that rapport because they trust you now but hopefully bringing on other clients through your door as well right so it's it's a repeat cycle if you do it properly um and yeah it's a, it's a massive component i think that what you were describing about the why is something that i've been trying to focus on more when i'm working with people and we're doing exercises and trying to explain, you know, like why we're actually doing the exercise and the reasoning behind it. I feel like that's something when I was just starting like a couple months ago, I wasn't really doing as well. Uh, that's really helped me out just because like you said, you know, they're, they're sort of seeing the, uh, they're, they're seeing the reason behind the exercise. And so they're more invested into it. And that's not going to be the same with, with every client right i mean as as you guys know as well there's just going to be clients who just straight up just don't really care they they come to you they want to get fit um maybe not so much with the athlete clientele but but with the adult clientele what i've come to notice is some people obviously absolutely want to know why um and they come they come from a little bit of knowledge as well in the adult population they might have a bit of background with kind of exercise science or things like that so that's when you kind of get into it with them if they approach you with that but um, there's going to be those clients who just don't care. You try and talk to them about the why, um, and they're just there to get fit. They're just there to sweat a little bit or, or work on a squat or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, so it's, it's not kind of universal, but it's, that's where it comes into being able to build that rapport and, and kind of communicate differently with different people that you're going to come across. Yeah, for sure. On top of like that conversation, like of communication, I know like, you know, you're, you're diving into the pain science and like understanding biomechanics and how that fits into it. Um, how do you go about maybe like educating some of your athletes or more like elite level athletes that have been around like that, that model of thinking, like the biomechanical model of thinking it might have some like misunderstandings of like some of the narratives. Like how do you go about educating them? Um, yeah. So, I mean, again, a, a lot of them have been, 
exposed to different trains of thought, different philosophies, obviously kind of with their teams, they might have a different strength coach who, who might not believe in the same stuff I do, which again, you got to come to understand it's everyone obviously has their ways of doing things and there's, there's no right or wrong as long as the thing that kind of gets me a little bit, I'll call it frustrated. It does get me frustrated is, is when you're getting an athlete who let's say does have an injury. Um, speaking of right now, one of my guys has, has kind of some low back stuff going on and he's, he's going to see, he has been going to see this Cairo <clears throat> And again, not throwing anyone under the bus at all. I've got a bunch of good friends who are Kairos. Uh, but with this specific one, he's just doing the old school 1980s. Okay, I'm going to see 30 people in a matter of 10 minutes here. Gets them in, does two quick adjustments on his back, sends them off on his way. And, and my guy who's got to play a, a game in the pros on the weekend is sitting here like, yeah, it felt good when it cracked. But two days later, he's in the gym with me, he's still having the same issues. Um, I ask him, has he given you any exercises? Has he shown you kind of anything to maybe, let's say, build up tolerance or kind of desensitize or just giving you any other options other than just a quick manip in 10 seconds, you pay him his 45 bucks and he's gone. And that's exactly, unfortunately, what has gone on. Um, and it's gotten to the point where, where it gets frustrating is, is when my athlete comes back and he says, yeah, so-and-so says my my hips are off by three quarters of an inch you know what I mean or or things like that and it's just language like that that, that kind of irks me and it it's hard to take a step forward obviously when you're constantly taking two steps back but as we said it's a it's a steep uphill battle and we just gotta keep chugging along because there is gonna be change that comes eventually so just gotta keep pushing for it that's right. We do have to because it's so frustrating to hear that. You have people who uh, value so much, like being an athlete, being super strong, and it doesn't even make any sense, you know? Like, and the narratives about a, around that kind of treatment don't make any sense when you've got someone who can put, I'm guessing, you know, so, several hundred pounds or a couple hundred pounds on their back or like lift it up and nothing happens to their back, but yet they're being told like the spinal manipulation is going to put in their back in place. Like that makes no sense even from a biomechanical perspective. Yeah. And it's so frustrating, frustrating to see how that impacts people psychologically. And it puts a horrible name on like on the rest of the rehab professionals when we should be working together. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, like it's, you hit the nail right on the head because that's exactly what's going on. You got these athletes who, you you get them on the track, you get them on the turf and they they can sprint, they can stop and go, they can do their change of direction stuff, they can squat, they can deadlift, they can they can depth jump and, and absorb kind of an altitude drop from a box or things like that. And then you're telling them they have their hips that are three quarters of the way out, even though none of that other stuff causes pain with them, right? Um so yeah, absolutely. It's it's gonna be a grind, but we just gotta kinda keep pushing forward. And I've had this conversation with with some other people on networking with social media people, obviously. And I've had that conversation with them where I've, I've straight up asked them, how do you guys stay kind of level headed, <clears throat> excuse me. And how do you keep pushing forward when it seems like once a week, someone's coming back and, and saying something to you like, Oh, my doctor's sending me for an MRI. Meanwhile, that client a week ago was just on vacay in Dominican and they were perfectly fine, had no back issues whatsoever. Um, they come back from vacay and all of a sudden it flares up again because they're back in their work stressors or their life stressors, whatever it is. They go to the doctor, can't figure it out. So he sends it for an MRI only to find an image that, yeah, okay, you might have a herniated disc, but I mean, let's be honest, you were completely fine. We weren't even thinking about it at all on the beach when you were sipping mojitos. So yeah. it is a grind for sure. But as we said, it's, it's something we just got to do and we got to stay loyal to and, and commit to, to the change. How do you think we could work together? Like if, like if uh, Dalton and I want to pop up shop in red line condition, <laughs> yeah. uh, like how, how would you see like ideally, you know, like uh, we work together? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's something that's kind of been on, on the blueprint for future success obviously is, is bringing in someone or some some people who kind of 
have that same level of dedication or who have that same level of experience uh, or passion for kind of the pain science realm, just so they can kind of educate a little bit more um, the clients who are, who are coming in through our doors instead of sending them out to um, just a, a standard practice um, where they're getting kind of all this old school, still kinesiopathological diagnosis. Um, that's something that is important for us to kind of meet in the middle in terms of allowing our clients or our athletes to get that proper education from, from someone who quite frankly is in the field like you guys, because at the end of the day, I am a strength coach. So I, I, I stay within my umbrella. Um, as you said, I try and blend it a little bit, but sometimes it's easier to hear it from another physio instead of hearing it from a strength guy. They're, they're hearing it from someone in the field, like, shoot, okay, this might be, this makes complete sense why these, I keep having my back crack once a week, once a week for the past year. And I literally feel the exact same as I did 52 weeks ago. Um, so that's a huge, a huge advantage and a huge stepping stone kind of moving forward, I think. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's huge because one, I think it keeps like, if you were to have someone within like your own place, like it keeps everyone in house one, like the common like communication between both the strength coach and the physio, um, is just, it can be constant. And I think if you both have an understanding of the same principles, like around pain, around loading, around like how you work with tendons, like different things like that, if that, if those narratives and those understandings are on the same page, it just makes that process like so much more seamless. And that I, I feel like the athlete or the, or the person that you're working with will feel so much more comfortable, like knowing that you, like both of you are on the same page and that their care is being like, taken care of on both ends. Like, I think that's huge for, for like that population. Yeah, absolutely. Once you get, once you get things aligned, that's, that's all it takes to kind of get the ball rolling. The last thing you want is for you to teach kind of one method or, or something you believe in and something, you know, is has a scientific support to back it. Um, but unfortunately it is a little bit kind of new age. People might not want to buy into it just yet. Um, and the worst thing that could happen is you teach this philosophy to this person and they head out to X or Y or whatever it is and come back with, with some kind of diagnosis that you, you just happen to know just is a crock of shit to be honest. Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Staying in house and, and things like that is crucial. I think too, to be honest, you know, it has to. There, there's got to be some humility from our perspective, you know, from to, to recognize that uh, strength coaches have a ton of value, you know, and, and that can, that can sometimes, it doesn't have to be you fixing all the problems. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm just kind of thinking of uh, brainstorming some examples. Like, like if I kind of decipher that this person's got like extension sensitivity in their low back, and I know they're working with Ian. Like Ian knows tons of exercises that could kind of take some of the load off of uh, the low back. You know, like I could maybe take them through some exercises, show them like, look, you know, there's still some things you. But then uh, someone like Ian, you know, uh, us communicating together, like to integrate that into his uh, program. That uh, quite frankly, like the athletes or the individuals probably spending most of their time exercising there you know like we've got to be willing to not be the only ones like uh like taking the whole uh case on right like I spread the love a little <laughs> yeah 100 yeah, percent. and i mean that comes from that absolutely comes from both sides of the spectrum i mean hmm. as you just mentioned there with with kind of allowing strength coaches to have a bit more responsibility or or to build kind of a rapport and a network with strength coaches that comes from from our end as well, because when it comes to kind of strength and conditioning, um, especially with kind of, and again, this, this might just be in recent years with me kind of getting frustrated with everything. I, I, I just don't even know who, who to refer out to anymore in terms of kind of my area. I'm not saying there, you know what I mean? Like you guys are all great, but I'm, I'm, I can't send someone from Kitchener to London to, you know what I mean? Once a week. Um, so that comes from our end as well. I'm just, I'm just kind of at the point where I just don't, I just don't even know who to refer to anymore because it seems like every client who's ever had some kind of issue or some kind of disc 
discomfort or, or pain, we'll even call it, is they come back with some kind of diagnosis that's just, it's just so textbook. You know what I mean? It's so like, it seems like such an easy cop out to just kind of throw this textbook diagnosis down on someone and, and they believe it because it's coming from such a, a, a figure such as clinicians or physios or chiros or massage therapists, whoever is given that diagnosis. Um, and it's just, yeah. Yeah, that's like, that's super frustrating, like to hear from our end. And like, I think that's something that continues to like motivate the hell out of us is to like, to, to get to the point where like, that's not a problem anymore. Like that can't be a problem. Like that's, that shouldn't be the way it is. Um, and I would agree with you in the sense, like I'm even at the place where like, if I had people ask me like, you know, a family member or something would ask me like, Oh, where should I go for like a video or, or anything like that? Like I have a hard time being like, ah, you know, like, I don't know if I want to refer you to like this person because like you're, you're worried about like the, that, that shit happening. It, I just feel like it happens way too often and it just needs yeah. to change. No, like I think that's the thing is we actually have to sit here and, and admit like there's a problem. Yeah. Like this is not, this is not like there's a reason why we get so fired up about it. You know, and it's because your family members or like your uh, people you care about could go and see someone who could put the fear of fear of God in them. Yeah. <laughs> that's yep. the last thing we want to happen to somebody. So who are you going to refer to? Yeah. Yep. And then I get front, like, I see someone like you, like, who's taking the time to educate himself on pain and, like, you know, biopsychosocial coach, really trying to like, develop this mindset around empowerment and all this stuff. Um, and I'm like, man, I would probably rather send some people to see you, you know, to, like, go to rehab than, like, see some other people where I know, like, the narratives around what they're going to do is going to be shitty. So, like, I don't know, man. I just think a lot. And, and, you know, I don't want to be negative because I think it, it's getting better. Like, we've talked about it. Like, even you're saying, like, we're, it is going forward. It is changing. But I just I just hope it moves a little faster. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Yeah, it's, it seems we have a mutual kind of feeling on the whole topic. And it is. We just got to be patient, unfortunately, which easier said than done sometimes, especially when you do have kind of a loved one coming back to you saying this stuff. Um, but like we said, that's that's our opportunity to educate. Um and hopefully kind of as we move forward, we'll get more, more clinicians focusing on this stuff and, and taking, taking courses and, and going to see, going to see, or going to listen to, to Greg Lehman instead of going to another, another course that they, they've been thinking about. So um, yeah, hundred uh, percent. Just to kind of like wrap up here, I'm just curious, like, uh, you know, we're both very interested in like the strength and conditioning world and, and what's going on there. Is there anything like, that you're coming across now that's new or, or that's really big topic that a lot of people are focusing on? Uh, no, I mean, in terms of, I've always been, and I'll, I'll probably always be a, a basics guy um, in terms of sticking to kind of the push, pull, lunge, carry options, things like that. I've always been a basics guy. Obviously you can have, you can do a little bit of creativity, um, within those realms but they're tried and true for a reason they've been around for decades for a reason um at, at the end of the day they, they just flat out work uh it's it's funny because obviously as you know with social media and things like that um you you get these you get these accounts who seem like they're constantly putting out every day they're coming up with some kind of creative exercise and it's just like man, what are you doing? Are you even, are you even training someone? Like, are, are you even putting in the time to train someone or are you just sitting around thinking like, Oh yeah, that's cool. Let's go maybe get my only client that I have to take a video of doing that. And it's, it's, it's just real gimmicky. And it's, it's, it's a shame that obviously people buy into clickbait and things like that because the, the basics are what works. getting strong is what works getting moving weight fast or being explosive with kind of a standard weight is what helps with power. You don't need any, you don't need any gimmicky or the, or the latest kind of hand clean or Olympic lift variation. You know what I mean? Just stick to the basics, pick the option and, and the progression or the regression that's appropriate for you at that time. Um, and, and the basics work, man. They've been around for decades for a reason. 
wait, so you're telling me I don't need a, a balloon in my <laughs> mouth uh, to work my diaphragm and then uh, <laughs> air bands on uh, external cues and then <laughs> stay out of the So you guys just had a big rebrand. I obviously, like, your stuff looks unreal. Um, how's that going? And is there anything coming down the pipe for you guys that uh, that's new? Yeah, we're uh, – so we got that, that rebrand going. Um, again, shout out to uh, Zach Hanna there. He's the guy's a creative genius. I know he's worked with um, a bunch of guys on, on social media, helping them with their brands as well. Yeah. Um, again, Nick's, Nick's younger brother, Zach, there. So I've known him for a while. He helped us with that whole rebrand. Uh, he just kind of – he's got some genius ideas in terms of, again, much like my philosophy, keeping things simple. He didn't do anything flashy with our – with our design by any means, but just the whole kind of message and, and meaning behind it is, is I think going to carry some weight and have some serious legs moving forward for what we're trying to do in the new year. So um, shout out to him for that. In terms of 2019, we got, um, we do have some kind of big things coming down. So um, we're getting into, we're actually putting together because we do spend a lot of our time um, with hockey players. We're working on putting together an on ice um, hockey Academy where we're putting together kind of our own on ice training skills session, some IQ stuff going on. Um, so we feel like that's a massive missing component in the industry, teaching kids to, to think the game, not only um, in, in the weight room and, and being smart with their strength and conditioning nowadays, but also on the ice, breaking down game tape with them and, and developing their IQ, things like that. So that's coming up uh, pretty shortly. Actually, we have all the info, um about to go up on our website and, and launch for that and then um we're going to get into actually hosting some seminars as well um coming up pretty shortly so maybe we'll have you guys even come down um yeah. for one of those seminars and and if you're interested in presenting on some some stuff like we said try and bridge that gap get some of our members in there get some of the people in in the KW region and in there and expose them to kind of how we see things nowadays from the rehab field and, and the whole BPS and pain science thing such as yourself would be a huge huge step and that's something we could totally arrange in the future um, and then yeah just continuing to kind of cater to the athletes that we currently have and, and continuing to build kind of the, the base of athletes that'd be awesome that's awesome sounds great like great stuff you guys, uh, I love the rebrand, man. It looks so good. It looks so good. I'm pumped. I'm pumped. It's you. so simple, too. It's even yeah. when he sent, I'm not gonna lie, he sent it to me and he, he put like a long, he explained it in the email. When I first opened it, I didn't even read what he said in the email. I was just so pumped. I was stoked to open it up. I opened it up and it's just a base, like a red line. And I'm like, man, what is this? And then I go back and read kind of what he said. And he's like, I'm telling you, man, this has some, this has some heat behind it. And, and he brought up the whole Nike thing. Everyone was like, what the hell is a Nike swoosh? And it's just some stupid, some stupid rounded check mark. Right. And, and look kind of what's coming up, but no, the message he put behind it and, and it ties in exactly with everything we're doing moving forward. And it's, yeah, he did a real smart, creative job with it. Yeah. It looks like, well, let people know where they can find you. Yeah. Let them know. Where can we find you? Uh, so you can find me at, uh, my Instagram obviously is Ian Schnarr training. Uh, that's my tag on Instagram there. Um, follow us on Redline, Redline conditioning, all one word, um, on Instagram as well. We're just getting through with the rebrand there. So we're going to be relaunching that page, um, or check out our website. That's going to be launching this weekend as well. Uh, Redline conditioning, uh, dot com. Yeah. Awesome. Before we go, though, we didn't get too many questions, but we did. A couple of your boys were throwing some uh, some chirps at you about your uh, fantasy hockey team. So, Oh, what have, is this? You don't have to talk about it if it's a rough year for you, but uh, if you <laughs> couple A bitter, couple bitter boys that are jealous right now. I'm sitting pretty in second, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, sitting pretty in second. And I made a couple, couple questionable trades in the beginning of the year, but it's it's coming around, and I'm, I'm – sitting pretty so i got uh i got some studs i got miko ranton in there he's an absolute monster i got Pasternak. he's a monster um got the best decor in the league so i don't know what these guys are smoking because the d are the hardest guys to find in fantasy but i'll be all right i'll be all right sounds like they're a little upset man uh, yeah i think so too a little bitter <laughs> all right Ian, man thank you so much for coming on it was an awesome conversation uh we appreciate it 
we, uh, we're looking forward to seeing what you come out with in the future, like with yourself and Redline and uh, continuing to work together, man. It's awesome. Thanks, boys. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. And uh, absolutely. It was a great time. Sweet. All right, man. We'll talk to you later. All right. Cheers, boys. Yeah.